Hi guys, it's your Science Teacher here, back with a, another video. This time I'm going to go through the whole of C15, which is using the Earth's resources. This is a triple science only topic. And without further ado, let's get started with today's video. The topic of using Earth's resources starts off by looking at corrosion. And corrosion is defined as the wearing down of the metal, which is usually oxidation. Uh, basically, what happens in corrosion um, is that a metal will form a more stable form of itself, either as an oxide or sometimes as a hydroxide. A specific example of corrosion is rusting and the conditions needed um, for rusting is that we need oxygen and water to be present. And the change in oxidation state results in the change of colour. So here we can see that we had started off with an iron nail and when water and when oxygen are added, um, the iron goes to a three plus uh, charge and we have iron three oxide and that is hydrated as well i should say because there was water present and that is why we see this change in color here is because this iron is going from having zero oxidation to now being a three plus iron we can do an experiment to investigate the effect of oxygen and water on rusting as shown in this picture on the top right hand side of our screen. Uh, basically what you can see is here is uh, a nail that has been placed in water and it has a free supply of oxygen. There's only water in there present and you can see um, that that nail clearly has rusted. It's probably been left there for a couple of days and rust started to build up. This one here has some drying agent um, in there. This means that this nail does get exposed to oxygen in the air. However, this drying agent will remove any water vapor that is around and we have a lid on top here. Um, so it's not being exposed to any water. All that water will be absorbed by the drying agent. And here, finally, I have an iron nail in water and oil. This means that um, this nail will be exposed to water. However, it won't uh, be exposed to oxygen due to that oil layer. Um, it won't let any oxygen in. Now, we can prevent rust rusting and corrosion by using a few different techniques. One technique um, is a sacrificial process and a sacrificial process basically means by putting a uh, more reactive metal uh, over the top of our metal that we're trying to protect um, and what happens with the more reactive metal is this is what gets oxidized instead and it protects the metal that we, we want to keep, basically. A specific type of uh, sacrificial is galvanization. And in galvanization, we use zinc, which is a quite reactive um, metal. A different technique um, is by coating with plastic. Obviously, plastic doesn't react uh, very well with oxygen in the air. And this will mean that our metal underneath stays quite protected. And lastly, what we do to our bike chains is we layer them in oil. Oil is a very protective uh, filament as well. It protects our metal uh, by not letting water settle on it. Now, metals are incredibly useful and often we end up mixing metals with other elements and when we do this, these are called alloys.
some spe some specific alloys you need to know about are steel which is a mixture of iron and carbon we need to know about brass which is copper and zinc and the reason why we mix metals or mix out metals with different elements is in order to change their properties now what happens when we add other elements into our metal is we disrupt the metallic structure and metals are giant lattices uh, meaning they are large repeating units and what happens is we can add different elements in which kind of disrupts the pattern this makes layers harder to slide over one another which often um, makes them no longer malleable so metals uh, that have, have been changed and um, to make an alloy are often harder they also often change the melting and boiling point and there will also be a change in conductivity it can become a worse conductor as electrons are harder to flow down it um, so it, it might be a worse thermal and electrical conductor But what we can do is we can um, change the amount of element inside that to make the properties exactly what we want. Like, for example, there's different types of steel in which we change the carbon uh, percentage in order to alter the properties, whether we want them harder or maybe a softer form of steel. As well as metals, um, in this topic, we also explore plastics, which are obviously a very important part of everyday life. We, we have plastic all around us, um, which can cause potential problems, as we looked at in the last topic, when we looked at reducing, reusing and recycling. Um, but there are two types of polymer that we need to know about, and they are thermosoftening polymers. And the key property of a thermo softening polymer is these can change shape uh, when we heat them. And any plastic that needs to get molded into shape really um, was created probably by thermo softening polymers. And the other type of polymer is thermo setting. Uh, polymers and thermosetting polymers basically uh, these will not change shape when heated which is incredibly important for things like pan handles um, because if they change shape every time uh, your pan was heated up that could be incredibly bad as uh, you'd have to get a new pan every time you uh, wanted some food now, to turn a thermosoftening polymer into a thermosetting polymer, we add something called crosslinks. And crosslinks are covalent bonds uh, between polymers, chains, and um, they're incredibly strong. And they hold that polymer together when it's heated. There's also one other way to change the property of our polymer. It's by changing the density. So we can use high density polymers as well to change um, how hard or soft our polymer is. The higher the density, the harder the polymer generally is. What we're now going to do is talk about some other useful materials we can make out of natural resources. And we'll start off by looking at ceramics. Now, what happens with ceramics is um, they are often made from clay and clay is a mixture of metals and also some non-metals such as silicon and oxygen. And what happens um, when we uh, put water in clay is the water can get in between our metals and non-metals. And then when we heat up our clay, uh, strong ionic and covalent bonds can form 
Um, and this is what makes our ceramics have such desirable properties. Um, they are incredibly hard, um, they are durable, and also they can be quite brittle, meaning uh, that if they do break, they smash into lots of different um, different objects um, that can be put back together and reform your ceramic material. Um, as well as being um, hard and brittle, they are also quite heat resistant and that's another positive um, thing about clay. As well as ceramics, we also have our useful material down here, which is glass and glass is made up of silicon dioxide. Also some limestone, which is calcium carbonate and also some sodium carbonate. And this needs to be heated to really high temperatures. And when this happens, uh, we get this wonderful transparent uh, material, which is also very hard and heat resistant. Um, and that's what makes it so desirable for building properties, really. Also a massive prop, uh, also a massive positive with um, making materials out of glass is the fact that glass can be recycled and a lot of new glass is formed from recycled glass. Recycled glass can be mixed with that silicon dioxide, the limestone and sodium carbonate to form new glass. Now we can call things that are made up of several elements, we can call them composites. And an example of a composite is shown here, which is cement. With science, we can actually make um, the concrete stronger. We call this reinforced concrete. And basically what um, reinforced concrete is, is uh, we combine the matrix, which is cement, um, with a reinforcement, which is um, usually steel for reinforced concrete. And most composites now do have a matrix and a reinforcement. We're now going to look at my favorite bit of the topic, which is how we can produce fertilizers and uh, a key bit of that, which is the harbor process. The harbor process is how we produce ammonia and the harbor process is basically uh, the key reaction in uh, the production of fertilizers and it's the reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen which forms ammonia and this is a reversible reaction and if we balance it out we'll put a two there and a three there and it's now balanced now the harbor process um, is carried out at specific conditions in industry it's important to um, remember back to our rates topic. Uh, the forward reaction is exothermic, meaning the backwards reaction must be endothermic. Now, uh, for the harbour process, if I want to maximise yield, I would want to carry it out at a low temperature. If I did this, then the exothermic reaction would be favoured and the reaction pushed to make more product. However, the reaction is carried out at 450 degrees C. The reason for uh, this condition is the fact that um, we make a, as much yield as ammonia as possible, and we also need our reaction to happen at a fast rate. Remember collision theory. If our uh, reactants aren't bumping into one another, they aren't going to react. So we take this um, temperature and we, we make what's called a compromise, uh, meaning that everyone's happy, we make enough yield at a fast enough rate. Another compromise we make is the pressure. The pressure for this reaction is 200 atmospheres of pressure. Now, if we look at this uh, reaction, we have four moles of gas going in and we make uh, two moles of product. Now, uh, two moles occupies less space. Remember, we can work out uh, how much space um, our, a gas would take up um, by times in it by 24 uh, decimeters cubed, and that would tell you how much two moles would occupy compared to four moles. 
and the two moles will occupy less space. So if I increase the pressure, I will make more product. So uh, high pressures mean more product. Now I can't go any higher than 200 really uh, because of the fact any higher um, would um, mean that we have an explosion risk and also uh, it might be a bit too expensive. So we make what's called a compromise again. Um, it's a high pressure, we still get enough yield um, but we don't have the risk of an explosion and also we have a iron catalyst now um, we know with catalysts they offer alternative routes for the reaction with a lower activation energy this means that the hard process doesn't have to be carried out at too high a temperature or too high a pressure now, the cool thing about the Harbour process is that any unreacted nitrogen or hydrogen gets recycled and um, can be reacted again. What happens at the start of the Harbour process is we pump in nitrogen and hydrogen, we pass it over an iron catalyst in the reactor, and then we put it through a condenser. Now, the condenser will remove the ammonia and after we've removed the ammonia, the um, unused hydrogen and nitrogen can be put back into the reactor and go again. Now we can make our own fertilizers in the lab by um, changing what we add to our ammonia. Now um, you just need to remember what salts are made when you add different acids. So what we can do is um, these are neutralization reactions. Uh, we can have our ammonia down here and we can add through a burette, we can add our acid in. And um, the reason why we add it during with a burette is um, so we don't have an excess of acid or ammonia. We can use a, a indicator to tell me when our neutralization has finished and we should have a maximum amount of salt then. So just a quick recap. If we have nitric acid, we will make a nitrate salt. Sulfuric acid, we will make a sulfate salt and if we have phosphoric acid we will make a phosphate salt and the key fertilizers made in industry are known as NPK fertilizers because they either contain uh, a lot of nitrogen phosphorus or potassium these are all essential minerals for a plant Without nitrogen, a, a plant cannot uh, form enough protein which um, plants need to form uh, new cells and grow. So fertilizers are incredibly important, especially due to the fact that we are over farming our land and um, we are removing a lot of the natural minerals. So we are needing to artificially replace them using fertilizers. Now that is the end of today's video so thank you for watching remember if you did uh, like the video please drop it a like and subscribe to the channel.